Welcome to Marketing, Media, and Money, your go-to podcast for proven profitable strategies, secrets, and resources from industry experts and global influencers to help you scale your business, shorten your learning curve, and stand out in a crowded, noisy marketplace. Here's your host, award-winning marketing and media strategist and international speaker, Patty Farmer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Marketing, Media, and Money podcast. I'm excited to have you here because we're going to talk about truth today and specifically how to speak your truth and get paid for it. So what is your truth? How can you feel safe speaking it? And how can you monetize it? So that's kind of exciting. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Jennifer Arizio is a prominent figure in the field of personal development and spiritual growth. As a gifted master, intuitive, and healer, she has devoted her life to helping others discover their unique soul languages and embrace their true essence. Jennifer is also a author, speaker, business strategist, and coach, and she has spent over two decades in her field. Two decades. I mean, think about that, right? Two decades. So currently, she has trained over 30 practitioners worldwide, has over 5,000 individuals connected to their soul languages. I mean, that is phenomenal. She's going to tell us all about it today. And again, how we can speak our truth and get paid for it. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you so much. It's such an honor. Um, I'm really thrilled and I'm excited. I'm excited too. I think this is something that, you know, we're hearing more and more about now, right? Everybody's talking about, oh, you got to speak your truth. You got to speak your truth. I think sometimes people don't even know what their truth is. Yeah. <laughs> right? No. And I think some I, don't mean. I think some people focus on the little T's and not the big T's. Um, and I think when people are starting to learn and understand what their truth is they can go overboard into extreme and so it doesn't come out savvy it comes out a little aggressive so there's a lot to talk about when it comes to truth i really think so too i feel like you know authenticity is a huge word now i kind of really believe in authenticity and alignment i really feel like it's important but sometimes people don't know their truth and maybe part of it is because they're lying to themselves not realizing that they are right but you know maybe not realizing that they are right and maybe it's just that they've been telling themselves that for so long that they believe it right mm -hmm. you know but i really think it is really important and it's really important to feel safe speaking it right you know and i love that we're going to talk about monetizing it so let's just jump right in so with your extensive experience in personal development and spiritual growth what led you really to focus specifically on helping others discover and speak their truth? I think because most of my life in corporate America, I had to stifle my truth, right? I was told you're too aggressive, even when I was asking for a pen. No, it doesn't work that way. No, we can't really talk about the truth. No, that's not what the client wa wants. And it read, led to a very frustrating life for me. I was like, I don't understand why we all just can't be honest and tell the truth and be in integrity. What Wouldn't that be good business sense? So when I got out of corporate America and I started working with clients, they would ask me, well, what do you feel? What do you think? And I would speak my truth. And I realized about 15 years in, oh, wait, I'm getting paid to, to, to speak the truth. And I think it's a buzzword now, right? Or we're evolving our consciousness to speak the truth because the old ways aren't working and it it i think you know because of the pandemic we realized how much we were just silently suffering and so people are really kind of diving into deeply to understand discover and then accept and then express their truth in a way that's not just safe for them but safe and harmonious for other people and a lot of people do it in a way where it's not safe and harmonious for them or for others. No, I think that's absolutely true. I think that there were some things that we think are our truth, and really it's something that we got from somebody else, and we just speak it thinking it's the right. truth, 
Now, I know that, you know, you and I have worked together and I've done some work with you. And um, it actually really helped me to know some that I didn't really know what my truth was. But I do have to tell you, sometimes my mom did a little bit more talking than I wanted. Yeah. And, uh, and you did a little more kind of... listening than you wanted to. Exactly. And uh, I have to tell you, I really learned a lot about what was my truth and what was what she was saying to me and really being able to understand the difference. Not to make her wrong. Right. It just wasn't my truth. Right. It just wasn't my truth. And so I think that is really important. So I know we talk a lot. We talk a lot when I was introducing you and I talk a lot about you, right? You know, um, for those of you who don't know, I've actually known Jennifer for a while. She's actually written for my magazine and has actually been our cover girl too. So, um, so I love that. But when we're talking about soul languages, could you explain the concept a soul language and how they relate to an individual's truth and essence. Yeah, you know, human beings love words for things. And I think everyone wants to establish a very strong connection with themselves and with others and whatever they call their higher power. And usually we need kind of a system or a formula or a structure of doing that. What soul language does is it puts words to the three core energies of your essential nature or your soul, your mission, how you feel that mission, and then your soulful personality. And so when you have them identified and you understand them, that allows you to really, in the simplest of terms, look at your language definition sheet and go, huh, I'm really suffering today. Oh, look, I'm utilizing my energy in an unsustainable or in a pattern way. And then you get to tune in with your soul and whatever you call your high power to shift your energy from pain and programming to consciousness. And when you put consciousness into anything, it grows. And so business is really about growing, right? And it's about evolution. It's about sustainability. So if you keep putting your pain and programming into your business, it's going to respond painfully. But if you put consciousness, it's going to evolve. So soul language is a way to put words to your essential nature so people can accept it on a fundamental basis and then have a deep conversation with themselves and with their higher power so they can be guided in everything they do. And your soul, your essential nature is never going to guide you in the wrong direction, right? And it's never going to say something you don't resonate with. It will tell you something you're in resistance about. And then you get to sit down and have a conversation with you and shift your beliefs around that so you're really speaking your truth which is in simplest terms you're whole and complete and if i believe i'm whole and complete then i have to treat everyone like they're whole and complete whether they're acting it or not and that to me is big truths right so when you take those big truths then you can determine what your little truths are in regards to those big truths mm -hmm. Now, when you really think about it and you break it down in those terms, it doesn't sound quite so scary. So right. it does sound a lot safer, right? right? You know? So how do you guide your clients in identifying and embracing their unique truth, right? Especially when they've been maybe conditioned to suppress it. Yeah. Well, first of all, we have to determine what their truth is, right? And then we have to kind of work backwards. So we have to understand their big truths, right? And their big some truths correspond to values and some are so innately in them that there's no way of getting them off of that. And so, Patty, do you want to play a game? Sure. Okay. So close your eyes. Let's tune into your heart. And I'm just going to ask you a question. Whatever pops up, you say out loud. What is something that you profoundly know about yourself that no one can change your mind around? Something that I profoundly know about myself, mm -hmm. right? That I believe in a higher power. Great. So that's a big truth for you, right? And everything then can be measured to that big truth, right? So for example, say you were having a bad day or you felt not enough, right? You could go then go pause and go, okay, when I tune into my higher power, is this really true? Or was I just off the mark today? Right. And then that begins to shift all of those little beliefs around that. 
And here's the thing about it, it's really about practice. And I think so often when people are starting to speak their truth, which in your case is at this point that you believe in a higher power, right? Then they tend to start to speak with their truth with people that aren't safe to speak their truth to, right? Because they're trying to go back to those people who have instilled in them programmings or beliefs in order to just say, no, 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 you're wrong. This is what I believe in. You can't hurt me anymore. And that doesn't work because those people are never going to hear you. So I also provide space and suggest my clients speak to people that are safe to speak their truth. Mm -hmm. And then I also talk to tell them to activate that in their body. So your body doesn't have free will. It's your mind and heart that does. So when we use that divine intelligence to activate safety, even if you've never felt it before, your body will hum at a vibration of safety. So before they speak anything, I tell them, activate the knowing that you're safe to speak your truth. And we keep doing that and we keep building that up. And that allows people to feel safer and to take bigger risks in speaking their truth. So you talked a few seconds ago about people who feel resistant, right? So if they're resistant or hesitant or fearful, right, or fearful, do you have any strategies that you would recommend that would help them to feel safe? And more than that, even to empower them to actually do so. Yeah. So I think you have to take everything sm small and small steps, right? Baby steps are huge. So the first thing I would tell them is, okay, you're hesitant, you're in fear. Let's do a little role playing, right? I want you to speak your truth to me, even if it comes out as a rambling kind of blah, blah, blah. And I want you to feel how I'm going to be loving and accepting. And I have no skin in that game, right? So once they start to feel that love and acceptance from someone else, which is really activating the love and acceptance in themselves, then they can go to bigger truth game than me. I also suggest that they tune in and find someone within their support teams that are truly supportive and then go and speak their truth there. I also tell them to look up nonviolent communication, which is a structure about how to communicate with people so you feel safe. And basically is like, I need this. Do you think you are able to do this? If not, that's okay. Knowing that you're going to go somewhere else to get that need met. So you're approaching conversations not by tit for tat or by conflict or war, but you're, conver you're creating a conversation based on what you need, seeing if that person is able to do that. And if not, you can move on to another subject or another experience. I think that's a powerful. Yeah. Uh, that's really, really powerful. So do you find that there's some common like barriers or obstacles that kind of get in the way really from them really like say fully expressing their truth? Yeah, it usually happens to people who are highly intuitive, highly innovative, that they see things nobody else sees. And, you know, they kind of let that fly when they were little and they would get back, well, who do you think you are? Like, what are you talking about? You don't know that, right? Or, you know, my favorite one when I was a kid was children should be seen and not heard. And my other favorite one was... Um, respect your elders. And I turned around to a 12 year old and said to my father, when they earn it, I will respect them. Right. Right. I yeah, know. Right. But, <laughs> right. But, you know, if you notice that you're, you get choked up a lot in your throat, if you notice the first sign of getting sick is always in your throat. Right. Those are all signs that you're not speaking your truth in one shape, form, or another. And you might be speaking your truth in business and have a hard time speaking your truth in relationships, right? This is not because you feel safe in one area, you feel safe in another. Another one is imposter syndrome is also a sign that you don't feel safe speaking your truth or you're undervaluing yourself. I think not speaking your truth comes down to the unsustainable belief that you believe you're not worthy. And so also if you tackle that belief, then that will also clear up your throat issues and your ability to express yourself freely. When you really stop and take that in, right? Like take that in really, right? Because I think 
it says a lot and you can like feel it. Yeah. And I, I find that in the conversations that we've had, once I learn to trust my intuition, which I have to tell you is so strong now. And I thought that in the beginning and you, you know, I did like, I, you know, now. I, was, like I did Like, I was like, what? Because I felt that my truth at that time was that when those things told me to do one or told me to do the other, you know, I also, that was one of the things with my mom that I had to work on. And I used to hear those things too. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, my parents telling me that they would pay me $5 if I could be quiet for 30 minutes. Like I, I could never do I, that. I, had I was sit still and be quiet. And I was like, okay, I'm going to lose this bet. I never could do it. You know, they called me chatty patty. And I remember thinking that that meant like I heard rather, you know, I, what I heard was I'm not supposed to talk, right? I'm supposed to be quiet and not have anything to say. And I will never forget when the first time that I was asked to speak. And then when I got my podcast, my mom was already passed away by then. But I remember at the time, you know, thinking, mom, like they're going to pay me to speak like they want to hear what I have to say and they're actually going to pay me right. to do it and I was so like that was like so impactful for me right you know because I felt like I would share and I cared and I had the truth and I knew in my gut that it was truth but a lot of times I think what happens if it's not the norm right if it's not what everybody else is saying right but I think the thing is, that's the things that people want to hire you for, right? It's not the norm. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. I think, you know, a lot of people who want to speak their truth or have that need to speak that truth, to have that need to have a forum for their voice, they have a spotlight in their soul. Their soul is longing them to be in the spotlight, right? Because they have a message that the masses need to hear. And I think so often we've been taught that, oh, that's so egocentric. Oh, who do you think you are? You get to be in the spotlight. But there is a soul calling and it's a drive. And I always tell people, if you're trying to fill a hole by being in the spotlight, then that's ego driven. If you are being pulled and know that that's your place, that's a soul calling. And the more that you have a willingness to accept that truth, because that's a truth, then the easier opportunities are going to fall into your lap. And the more you're going to be be able to succeed, the more you're going to be able to monetize it and people will want to pay you for it because you're accepting it so profoundly, because it is a calling, because it's an evolution and, and a longing for you to provide people with information and messages. Which I think is so important. So what would you say about if somebody is speaking their truth, how would that contribute? I, I love that word. Contribute to like personal fulfillment, both professionally, right? Successfully, like how it is in their business, in their relationships, in their personal life. So how does speaking one's truth? Because sometimes when you're speaking your truth, other people don't really want to hear it, right? Whether it's personal or business. So how can that contribute to your fulfillment and success in business well, the, and life? The key to that is understanding and accepting that as you speak your truth, you receive. Meaning that you are speaking your truth and because you are, there's an outlet for that. Normal people, normal situations sometimes when people speak their truth, they're speaking their truth to, they're preaching to the choir those people don't want to hear it or they've been people pleasing for so long that now they've moved to speaking their truth. People are like, what, what, what? Right? So it, it, when you speak your truth, you have less codependent relationships, right? You have more boundaries, which lead to not over service. You know, listen, I over service clients, right? You over service clients, but there comes a time where we over service to our detriment when you're speaking your truth, you're going to have boundaries. You're not going to over service your clients, right? You're really going to have value and respect for yourself. You're going to put some price tags and some uh, money amounts to your services. Those are all behind speaking your truth. And so all of that leads to 
better relationships, more income. You're also, when you're speaking your truth, you're not going to keep putting up with people who run all over you and never ask you how you are. And we've all been in those conversations, right? I was walking with a friend of mine today and she's like, oh my God, I've been talking for like 10 minutes and, and I haven't asked how you are. And I was like, no, that's cool. I'm cool with hearing about your life right now. Like, I don't really want it. Like, I'm cool. I don't want to talk about myself. Don't need to, right? But there has to be a give and take in relationships. And so if you're not willing to actually feel safe being vulnerable, because that's what it is, right? Then how are you going to have that give and take? And in order to receive and receive big, you have to be safe being vulnerable. And one of the things I really love about you, Patty, is that you do. You have this natural ability to feel safe being vulnerable because you receive huge, right? Thank you. You're welcome. And the more you receive, right, the more that you have to know that you're safe to say yes, no, that doesn't feel right. And that takes courage. So it's kind of all wrapped up into one, but I don't know any really successful business person who is not speaking their own truth and succeeding happily in business, meaning being fulfilled, not just with money. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I really have found for me that one of the things when you first taught me this uh, process and principle um, was that I get to choose, right? You know, I do know that I overserve, but sometimes I do it by choice yeah. because I want to. And I think that that's where I learned to balance that and boundaries, right? I get to choose when I want to overserve, for lack of a better term, and when I'm going to set boundaries. Like, you know, I am very, very clear now when as part of my onboarding process of what is okay and what's not okay like i give all my clients my cell number right i tell them feel free to call me if you're stuck i don't want you to wait to our next call but that doesn't mean i want you calling me at 10 o'clock at night right. or four o'clock in the morning right these are the boundaries i don't take calls on the weekends unless it's an emergency right you know so you know but again it's in marketing and really if there's not blood it's probably not an emergency right so yeah. Um, so with that said, though, but I feel like once I was able to do it, it felt so good. Like speaking that truth, really, it was like, oh, yeah. that's really wonderful. But I think it is for them too, because when you speak your truth and if they receive it, then it enables them to be able and empowers them to know, oh, well, you know, I can't call Patty after this amount of time, right? Yeah. You know, so that empowers me to either take the next step myself to, you know, or whatever the case right. may be. Right. Yeah. But I have found for me, that has been huge. huge. And, and here's the thing. When you actually have those boundaries and speak your truth, you're going to have a more conscious group of clients. Right. So I pick my clients through the peanuts characters. I just tune in and I go, okay, so what peanuts character is this person? And my people are Linus's and Sally's. Right. I don't take on a Charlie Brown because it's victim energy and I just want to eat them for breakfast. Like I can't deal with that. Right. I don't take on Woodstocks because they tend to be crazy. But Patty, I used to take on Lucy's. And Lucy always pulled the football. Always. Like, I'm like, why am I surprised? Here it is again. Right. So when you understand and when you have the appropriate boundaries and speak your truth, you're gonna pick those clients that have less drama right? Less victim energy, less codependent relationships, right? And who want to actually do the work in whatever form that is, whether it's transformational work, whether it's actually, you know, actually coming up with their marketing story or whatever that looks like, rather than someone goes, well, I didn't have time or I just couldn't do it. You're going to actually have people who actually are in the game with you. And those are clients that are fun and those are clients that are enjoyable and those are clients where you can end your day and feel peaceful versus, you know, sitting at your desk berating yourself because, oh my God, I should have, would have, could have. So true. I know for me that one of the criteria for me that it's so clear now is that I only want to work with people that bring me joy and feed my soul. Yeah. Right. You know, that's it. Bring me joy and feed my soul. Like I got into business, right, not to have another job, right? You know, I got into business for 
the reasons that I want to serve and how I want to help people and what my mission is. And so I think that is really important to me. And sometimes we can get in our own way yeah. for that. And all of a sudden it's like, well, you're the CEO of your company, buddy, right? And so sometimes that means we're the ones that have to shift. And sometimes that means we have to learn about Exactly. And we have to be responsible. It's, you know, we don't get to just say, you know, I used to think one of the things that I really learned uh, working with you is I always knew what my triggers were. Like I'd done some inner work. So I knew that because of some of the traumas that I'd had when I was younger, um, what would trigger me. But I thought, <laughs> this was my truth. That was not my truth, right. right? I thought was, if I knew what my triggers are and I tell you what they are, and I say, oh, just so you know that this is something that really triggers me and I don't do well with that and I do better with this, I feel like I'm really helping the situation by saying, oh, this triggers me and this, I react better to this, that once I've done that, now it's your responsibility not to trigger me. That's what I thought. Well, and I lived with that <laughs> for a long time. And I I love that. I mean, I, I love it and I hate it both for you, right? Because like you're halfway there. You're like, I'm expressing my truth. And then the next part, which you've totally learned is like, you, you keep a boundary. Okay, you've crossed that boundary. Yeah, no, we're not playing anymore, right? And I think that, you know, that also comes from, in my experience, of those parental relationships that said, you know, my father was like, um, you know, kids should call their parents. Uh, I'm the kid. What are you talking about? Like, call me back, right? And I think so often we're set up in those, oh, well, this seems normal because I'm telling you what I want and you're going to give it to me because that's the role we played in some of those parental relationships, right? They told us what they wanted and we gave it to them, which is kind of the reverse of what's supposed to be going on. And so it becomes this warped sense of little T instead of the big T. The big T's are the ones that don't make you feel icky and sticky inside. They're the ones that you go, oh, yeah, that feels good. That feels like sitting in warm water and, you know, comfy chair. And it takes a little bit of courage to keep stating your big T's and living your life by them. And when you do, people are going to come around and go, how did you, how did you do that? How did that happen? Can you teach me that? Can you talk to me about that? And I, and I think that's most of what our all of our careers are based on, right? We we've hopped over that's, those, yeah. I kind of felt like when I really got really clear on that, I realized that that sounded good, but ultimately I was responsible, right? Which actually took me to the one thing. Like I have to tell you, I have six daughters. Sure, everybody knows that about me. And there was like one thing that collectively they did that literally drove me bananas and no matter how much i told them that i didn't want them to do it like it was like like i would say i like for my birthday i don't want you to text me i want you to call me right but they live in a world where they love to text and and all this kind of stuff and no matter how much i would say i really want you to call me my husband actually even called up my daughter once and said i want you to know that no matter what i do for mom i can have she could have the most amazing birthday if you don't call her, no matter what I do, it's never enough because she's waiting for you to call her. And um, and it kind of happened like, and I would kind of be upset yeah. about it, right? And finally, I just literally went to them and said, like, I don't understand. Like, I need you to tell me why this is a big thing for you. I'm not asking you to call me every day or every week or every month. I'm just saying on Mother's Day and my birthday, on those days, right. I would like to have a phone call. And um, and my daughters are like, okay, except for my older daughter who loves to speak truth. And she said, you want me to tell you why, mom? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, because you kind of told me to do it. And I don't like it when you tell me to do things. And so she said, you didn't ask me to do it. You told me to right. do it. And because you were the mom and I was a daughter and I was like, no, I didn't. And she said, no, mom, really, you did. And so um, and so that was kind of like a, a big thing. Right. You know, and once we actually talked about it, like now they always call me on my birthday and Mother's Day and not to mention all, all the other times that they call me, too, though. But 
but really they understand now that that was important. Yeah. Important. But it was, that was their truth. And once they actually told me and they said, oh, well now we could come to a, to a collaboration. Kind of yeah. We collaborated and said, oh, okay. How about this? Right. You know, this is this and this is this, right. You know? And so I have to tell you, it like literally bothered me for a long time before we actually got to that point and I understood why she wouldn't do cat, like why she wouldn't do it. Yeah. And I was like, why didn't you just do that? And I think a lot of people don't express their truth in relationships because they think that they've done it and they're like, okay, why are you following through? I've talked about this. Instead of having that give and take in relationships and that conversation, uh, right? Nobody, nobody likes to be told what to do. And so when you have like, no, what I don't like to be told what to do, it's a joke around our house. Like, yep, why don't you tell me I had to do that? Cause I'm not going to do it. Right. Like, but if you ask me, I will do anything for you. And so it's really about giving people the forum, not just for yourself to speak the truth, but for each of you to speak the truth and then for a kind of truth collaboration to happen. And, and remember, focus on the big truths, not the little truths, because those are based on belief systems versus the big truths, which are divine rights, right? Exactly. I mean, I didn't, and there was never a time that I went and said, oh, well, why won't we do this? Like, yeah. blah, 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 blah. like, you know, whatever. It was just like, but I have to tell you, I remember the day I had that conversation. It did feel vulnerable <laughs> and courageous at the same time. <laughs> at the same time, I felt vulnerable and courageous at the same time. And like, it wasn't an argument. It wasn't right. I just said, this is what's important to me. She told me why she wouldn't do it. And then we came to, you know, a collaboration of what was okay. Now, literally, like that was like years ago. And now it's like such a, such a kind of a little thing, but it was a big thing. Right. And look at all the goodness that came from it, right? Like the, the foundation of the relationship has changed in a better way. You're closer because you had that trustworthy, truthful conversation and here's the thing, when we're having those, when we're speaking our truth, the charge has to be gone. Meaning, sure. right, you can't come to it all ready for battle, right? You have to know that your love is supported and provided for and that you're safe. And that's about activating. Divine intelligence is your body. Fill my body with the feeling and knowing that I am safe. And if you have to do it a hundred times during a conversation, you do it a hundred times during a conversation. Would you say that really, I remember thinking like sometimes to be courageous and vulnerable. And there was a time when I was younger where I really felt like not being authentic, being vulnerable. And to me, those were not the exact same thing, but I used to feel like being vulnerable was a weakness where now I feel like it's a strength. Yeah. I love, right? I love that because that's a very warrior like attitude and I have warrior energy as well. You know, when when we realize that it is a strength, right? It, in order to receive, you need to open up your arms. You're not going to be like this. Like, that's not going to get you anywhere. When we realize that the strength is really knowing that we are supported, safe, no matter how we're being vulnerable, then we can utilize it as a superpower. Instead of trying to, you know, kind of be in a bull in a china shop and get what we want, Right when we are honest and when we are vulnerable, it gives people another opportunity to support us and help us. And listen, here's what the truth is: everybody's like, "Why do really wants to be help helpful?" Right? Every really want body wants to be of service to somebody else. We just don't give people a lot of chances. I remember, <laughs> remember being in the post office, and this woman had this three baby carriage, three baby carriages with the three wow. babies in the carriage and then boxes on top of the baby carriage. And she's trying to open that heavy post office door. And I'm like, do you need any help? She's like, no, I got it. And I was like, no, you don't have it. Like so often we, especially for fiercely independent women, right? We had to be fiercely independent. We have to do it all. And that doesn't really allow a lot for the universe to come in and support us. We keep fist arming the universe. And that's really not our truth. That's a learned behavior, right? 
So True. when you kind of open it up and go, you know, I mean, I mean, I've had some some silly situations where I've had to ask for help, right? I remember a couple of years ago when I broke my ankle, you know, I had to walk the dog, even though my landlord said he would walk the dog, right? So I'm outside in November in the cold with the cast on minus the shoe on the other foot. And Marlon's like, Jennifer, I told you I would walk the dog. Why didn't you call you? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I couldn't ask for help. Like I had this little fit, right? And then I was like, this is ridiculous. Like this is, imagine what this is showing up in every aspect of my life. So I started asking for help and my business grew because I was open to receiving. And it doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong. And here's the thing. If anyone was to ask me for help, I'd be there in a second. Right. So exactly. by kind of closing that giving and receiving cycle, you know, it had huge impact on my life and in my business. And it allows for something much more greater to happen, which is what you talk about a lot, which is collaboration between people. And I think it's really important, too, because one of the things that I learned many, many years ago, which is. I always love to serve and I love to help. And so I'm always like one of the first people to say, oh, no, I got that. I'll do that. I'll do that. And one time I remember when it really became apparent to me, I realized that I had pretty much hit a wall and I actually really didn't have the bandwidth or the capacity to do it. And I remember thinking, you know, why do I do everything? Like I'm the one that, <laughs> you know, and I kind of ran into that little pit for a second. Um, but actually, one of the things that I've learned early on for me is whenever I feel myself go there, I actually take my phone out and I and I put a timer on for 30 seconds and I tell myself, you can say, do, feel, whatever you want for 30 seconds. But when the 30 seconds is out, you're putting your big girl panties on and like moving on. And that really does work for me to give myself that time. But in this moment, I remember it hit me and I thought, well, you know what, Patty, maybe because you're the first one. Not that that's not always a good thing, right. but am I actually stepping up and doing that? So maybe somebody else might want to do it. And maybe for them, it's more like, well, I really like to help, but Patty always, you know, is the first one to step up and then I don't really have the opportunity. Right. So sometimes asking for help, really what you're doing is you're giving somebody else the opportunity to share their gifts yeah. and to be able to help in a way that they want to, that you don't have to be the person to do it. Maybe you've always done that. Maybe there's probably a reason if you actually kind of tapped into that and really realized, oh, why is that? Like, is, do you really feel like that's the only way anything ever gets done is if you're the one that does it, right? You know, I mean, I remember when I was raising my, my girls and um, I started this thing where they would kind of hand off chores to each other. And there was always like a hassle. It, like it literally every single weekend became a hassle. And I finally literally said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to write down a criteria of when it's done. And when you're handing them off, you're just going to read the criteria and you're either going to accept it. And if you do, and then you find out something's done, that's on you. But now we all have a criteria. There should be no reason we have drama. That actually super worked for us, right? You know, so I feel like, you no, know, you just have to think about what those things are. So here's what I want to say. What I want to say is in this methodology, this soul language methodology that you teach, uh, and you don't just teach it, you live and breathe it too, right? You're, I mean, that it is just who you are. <laughs> How would you say that embracing that and really understanding it can help someone in their business to be more profitable, help them with like maybe their coaching practice, yeah. their speaker, you know, speaking, like all of the things that everybody who's listening right now, like whatever those things are, like how would doing that and really within your soul language methodology, how does that help them to do that? I think the least amount of things that it does is it allows you to understand not to take everything too personal. I think so often we take things personal in business. Here's a here's a perfect example. I sent an email to a, a kind of a new friend, an associate, and I sent it about a week ago. And I'm like, why didn't she get it? Why isn't she answering? What What's going on? Like, what did I do? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's just take a deep breath. It's not about me. Like, let's just tune in. 
Okay, let's go back. Let's connect. Today she reaches out. She's like, I've been away for two weeks. Okay, right? So it it allows you not to take things personally. And when you're not taking things personally or from pain and programming, you make a lot of clearer decisions. It also allows you to understand that you are whole and complete, which means you're not living from a place of scarcity. And so often people like make a lot of bad decisions, especially business from scarcity. We take on wrong clients, we over service, we're afraid to say something. So when you're really deeply connected, it allows you to know you're um, supported and provided for. It allows you to know that your clients aren't source for you, they're just a resource. And it allows you to really to tune in and go, what do I wanna say to my community? What do they need to hear? And so that's just like the tip of the iceberg, but it really gives you a solid place of feeling home and connected and allowing for yourself to be in the flow because you're not operating from bad experiences, bad programming, or painful uh, episodes in your life. Man, that is really powerful. So Jennifer, this has been amazing. So I want to be able to say that I know everybody's going to want to connect with you. What is the easiest way? Where should they go? Where's the easiest way for them to connect with you, to learn more about your methodology, to connect with you? Because I just have to tell you, you guys want her in your life. Thank you. I'm on her. Um, and she connects you to really amazing people too. Thank you. So you could go to soullanguage.us and hit the soul language section and uh, sign up for a discovery session. That's the best way because that big gives people an experience of soul language. It's there's no agenda, no attachment. I love identifying one first one people's soul languages at least one during that session. So you can really get a taste and a flavor. Um, I answer my own emails. I pick up my own phone. Please don't call me at three o'clock in the morning either. Um, and I'm on all the social media at Jennifer Rizzio or Soul Language Founder. Oh, that's beautiful. And you came with a gift, which I really, really love. So tell everybody a little bit about the gift. Yeah, so I really can see a business in my head and see where the energetic holes are, where their gaps are. So this free gift is about three easy tools that you could do right now to change your energetics so you can have profound success. And it's, it comes in a beautiful little diagram and you put it on your desk, you keep it in your wallet. And when you're feeling icky, sticky, or sad, or struggling in your business, you take it out and you do one of the three tools so you can shift the energetics of your business so you can receive more. Wow, that's powerful. I love that. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much. So yeah. this is the part of the show that I like to call hashtag open mic, um, where you've shared so much, but if we had to narrow that down to just one, you know, just one marketing media or money strategy, what would that number one strategy be? Yeah. I tell all my clients to tune in and ask what's the one thing they're going to do today, tomorrow, this week this month, this year to grow their business. I think so often we're kind of trying to, to jot down all of our techniques and all of our strategies. But if you tune in and you ask that question, you're going to be divinely guided to those strategies that are actually going to generate results versus running around your chicken without a head, just doing things. Oh, that is a good piece of advice and a great strategy. So I love that. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with me and sharing yeah. your brilliance so generously. As usual, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. It's my honor. I love seeing you. Thank you so much. And to my audience, thank you so much for being here with me this week, last week, next week. I really appreciate you showing up week after week and just sharing this time with me. If you enjoyed today's episode, and I'm sure you did, please like and review our podcast on your favorite listening platform. And we talked a little bit earlier about the magazine. So I would love to invite you to grab your free copy of the magazine at www.m3magazine.com. Until next week, thank you so much. Have a phenomenal day and a fabulous week. Thank you for joining us today on the Marketing Media and Money Podcast. To shorten your learning curve even more, make sure to grab your free copy of the Marketing Media and Money Magazine at m3magazine.com. That's M, the number three, magazine.com. 
I promise your business will thank you.